starts the final session of World Energy Wind Conference 2021, New Delhi. So this is the last uh, session of the conference. The title is uh, Renewable Energy System and Grid Design. So there are seven speakers, well, some less than seven speakers. Anyway, we have so uh, active uh, discussions. We will have the active discussions of the uh, energy system and the grid design. Uh, but I'm unfortunately, unfortunately, I'm not familiar with this field. So I would like to ask uh, uh, my co-chairman, uh, Dr. Baralman, uh, to be uh, exact, <laughs> exact uh, session chairman. Okay, please start uh, the session, please. Thank you, Professor Rakawa. And uh, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all the panelists here and also attendees. And this is a new format in the last almost like couple of years we are trying to see on the online sessions. So it is a different game when you're trying to organize the conference and the panel discussion. And as we see here, we have eminent speakers, both from academics as for the industrial practitioners. And it's going to be mainly on the renewable energy systems and the grid design. As we move forward, as you're seeing, of course, I should talk about Indian context. We already crossed 100 gigawatts of the renewable energy systems. And we are moving towards the era of, by 2030, we are going to have 500 gigawatt of the clean energy sources. <coughs> this is kind of a target. So we are going to have a lot of RE is going to come into the system. So here we are trying to talk about, the, when you're talking about grid design, whether it's going to be limited to the large scale grid, or it could be a micro grid, or a nano grid, or a combination. These are the challenges you're going to see as you move forward. Because with the renewable energy, with the distributed generation, we can see every possibility in this aspect of it. So moving forward, we have a great, I, I don't want to take much time. Maybe I'll intervene later. I have Professor here. I think he's got uh, almost more than four or three or five decades of experience. He's going to talk about on the subject of getting ready for 100% renewable energy. So I need a Professor here. Uh, do you start my presentation or should I do it? No, you can share, you can share your presentation. I cannot see my presentation. Okay. Please start. Okay. <laughs> no, thank you. Oh, this was very difficult. Uh, uh, what is the possibility to come to the next uh, slide? You have to tell me. I will move it. Yeah. Ah, here. Yeah. I will I will move it. Yeah. I, I will move it for you. Yes, do you do? Okay, then the next uh, slide. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, in my presentation, I will start with the introduction, a short introduction, then the grid connection and requirements, and uh, we will end with a future prospect. Next uh, slide, please. Uh, here you see uh, the European network. Um, the blue one is the Central European net um, with um, the extension from Portugal until uh, Romania in the uh, southwest and southeast of Germany and Germany and Denmark in the northern parts. Um, and Germany has with uh, more as 50% of the, uh, the renewable feed-in, uh, I mean the highest uh, influence of the uh, renewable in the grid. And um, we have made a lot of experience over the time and we tried also uh, to do something. The next slide, please. Um, oh, this is not the next, uh, it is not so, uh, uh, we have two. The, this is uh, the only one. There is last one, uh, uh, one slide. 
Uh, okay. Um, yes. No, no, no. Uh, go back to the. Uh, we have uh, the last. Yeah. Um, uh, the grid to, to stabilize means at first uh, to control the voltage, and uh, we have the voltage drop. This uh, picture is missing, um, where the voltage is controlled by the reactive power or reactive current, and uh, we have a drop. Let us say of about uh, uh, ten percent of the voltage. It means when we uh, have a very strong uh, uh, load, uh, 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 reactive load, then we get a lower voltage. It means ten percent lower voltage means twenty percent lower load, and this means that we have a self-regulating uh, effect in the grid. The Frequency is more stable normally. Uh, the uh, island grid has a deviation, let us say, of about plus minus minus one hertz in our uh, plus minus one hertz <laughs> in a, a grid with uh, some hundred uh, megawatt uh, installed power, but in our rear. Uh, European interconnected grid, we have a deviation of only about plus minus 50 milliards. It means one per mil. Yeah? And this means a, a low uh, a variation is enough when we have uh, one millihertz over frequency, then it's clear we feed in more as we uh, uh, um, have in the load. Or when we have an uh, under frequency of one or two millihertz, then uh, the load is higher as uh, the feeding in. And this is enough to control the grid. Yeah? So the next picture, <coughs> please. Here you see the uh, beta factor means the feedback of the power, and so we can control uh, this uh, rotating uh, uh, mass and uh, the frequency as a end uh, result. Yeah? And uh, we get uh, 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 the drop function by this uh, uh, influence of beta. The next picture, please. So, now we come to the grid uh, connection and requirements. Next picture, please. <clears throat> um, to integrate a wind or TV system in the grid means that we are working uh, normally in uh, the low voltage uh, uh, side and we connect the wind or uh, photovoltaic system uh, in the uh, 400, 690 volt uh, level um, and uh, come to the medium voltage uh, level and uh, then to the next higher uh, voltage levels. Yeah, the next picture, please. <coughs> here you see uh, wind turbines and uh, photovoltaic system here. Uh, it is uh, a special uh, in uh, uh, Tenerife uh, 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 operated system and so on. Next picture, please. Here you can, oh, so we have also uh, lost the other picture. Uh, the picture before uh, shows the uh, uh, Grid connection station, uh, st uh, station in a uh, uh, normal uh, grid um, in on the countryside, onshore side, and this is the offshore side uh, connected system with um, uh, with uh, high voltage DC uh, connection to the uh, 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 onshore side on the grid, on, uh, 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 off onshore side on the grid, yeah. Next picture, please. Of uh, yeah. So, 
And now we see the high voltage uh, uh, and low voltage levels of our grid. Um, the low voltage level is this level where we integrate uh, only the photovoltaics. Yeah? But wind turbines are normally uh, integrated in the medium uh, voltage, in the 20 kilovolt uh, uh, side. Uh, only one, two or so uh, single wind turbines are uh, possible to uh, uh, connect here. But normally, the wind turbines are connected here in the uh, 110 kilovolt uh, uh, level. Um, or wind uh, uh, parks with about uh, 100, 200, 300 kilo uh, uh, megawatt, uh, megawatt of air or megawatt. And uh, for high uh, uh, systems, uh, for very large systems in the 500,000 uh, megawatt uh, level, one gigawatt, two gigawatt, three gigawatt system, we must integrate here in the 380 <laughs> level. Okay? So um, now uh, a very important thing is the short circuit power. You see, when we have a short circuit power, let us say <coughs> of about uh, 30 gigavolt of air, then we can integrate uh, a wind, top, uh, wind uh, park or a uh, nuclear power station or a uh, uh, as a power station with about uh, three gigawatt. Uh, this means a very large system. Yes. So, but uh, here by uh, three gigavolt up here, we can by uh, in the 110 kilovolt uh, level, we can integrate about a wind park of uh, 300 uh, megawatt. Yeah. Next picture, please. So we come to the grid effects, and here we have the change of the short circuit power, the uh, voltage variations, and so on uh, uh, by uh, output variations of the uh, power, uh, flicker effects, harmonics, uh, grid resonances, all the other. Uh, we are uh, uh, not, uh, uh, we have not in this consideration. Thank you. Next uh, picture, please. So at first we look for the short circuit power, and uh, you see when on the light, uh, right uh, left side we have only the grid. But when we integrate a wind park or other system, then we have uh, two systems are parallel working, and then we have a higher uh, 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 source, and we must be sure that that this current is not over the maximal current where your uh, uh, safety systems like fuses or switching cabinet and so uh, are designed. And you see by uh, synchronous uh, uh, generators, we have here a short uh, circuit current of eight times of the nominal range. It means when we have a, a system with one gigawatt, uh, then has this uh, system eight gigawatt short circuit power. Yeah, but for inverter feed in, we have the same level. It means uh, that uh, the short circuit uh, power is the same as the nominal power. Yeah, the next picture, please. So uh, harmonics, uh, you see. Uh, we get from the uh, inverter feed-in. Uh, at first, we started here uh, on the left side with uh, only two steps or three steps uh, by a six pulse or twelve pulse inverters. Now, uh, today, uh, this is also possible by um, multi-step uh, inverters to get uh, ten steps, and then we get a very good uh, uh, sinus form. Or here uh, on the right side, uh, this IGBT inverter uh, in uh, switching operating, so that we have here uh, uh, a current uh, tolerance band uh, controlling. Yeah. 
uh, and then we get by a, a small uh, filter system a very good uh, smooth output. Uh, very important is that we all this uh, uh, guidelines then when we have uh, too high uh, uh, harmonics in the grid then uh, some uh, 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 consumers can be destroyed when the filter systems or uh, uh, con compensation systems in uh, combination with uh, uh, inductivities of motors and so uh, are working in this uh, uh, eigenfrequency, then uh, it can be destroyed. The next uh, picture, please. Next picture, please. <coughs> Grid resonances can be uh, uh, a problem when we have a far uh, distance connected uh, 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 um, feeding in system, though that the uh, impedance of this uh, system will change by uh, different loads or different feeding in system and so on. Yeah, so you must be very careful when you have uh, a case like this. Next picture. Uh, here you can see the voltage uh, uh, control by reactive power. The reactive power control means that we uh, change the reactive power. This is a green line. Uh, we are uh, reducing the uh, feeding uh, the uh, uh, reactive power from 150 uh, uh, kilovolt up here to uh, minus. 20 kilovolt up here uh, uh, from overexcited to underexcited, and you see the voltage goes down from about 402 to about uh, 398 uh, volt. It means we change the voltage about 1% in this picture. Yeah, so next picture, please. And <clears throat> Uh, the grid coding might mean that we have to fulfill also this port uh, and to support the grid by this uh, lines of faults. It means that we have to uh, support the grid when we have a, a breakdown of the voltage. Yeah? And though uh, we can uh, be safety that the system, the total grid, is not uh, uh, destroyed in a, a very small failure. Yeah. Next picture, please. Uh, wind prediction. Uh, it is also a field where we started uh, about in the 90s uh, that we get uh, information what we can expect in the next or over next day on wind and power in input and so on. So. It is very important for us uh, to uh, find out uh, 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 control of our grid. Yeah. Next picture, please. Um, here you can see the, uh, the uh, green one is uh, wind feed in in the year two thousand nine, and uh, you see that in the right side, uh, all the uh, uh, peak levels are covered by this uh, wind energy. But the problem is that we have also uh, very low uh, basic uh, loads. It means the basic load goes also down. And this was the background that we uh, started also. The next picture, please, um, to find out uh, a possibility to control the grid by uh, power reserve. It means that we make a very safety uh, uh, prediction, and then we can say we can here on the left side uh, uh, make a, a positive, a negative regal uh, control reserve. It means that we go down from about uh, 35 to about 50. Uh, megawatt and on the right side we started the uh, opposite thing from 50 to uh, 35 uh, or 40 and then 
we have fitted in a positive uh, uh, power reserve. Yeah, the next picture, please. But uh, when we control down this uh, power, then we lost this energy. But this energy we can uh, use when we have a, a, a hydrogen power system like this, that we can use this uh, too much uh, energy for this electrolysis, and we can store it in uh, hydrogen, uh, perhaps also in uh, oxygen uh, uh, gases, over uh, pipelines in uh, a pipeline grid. And when we need more power, then we can use this uh, uh, power by this uh, gas and feeding back in the grid. Yeah? So we have the possibility to store and we can uh, feed back this uh, storage, uh, storage uh, uh, gases. Yeah. The next uh, picture, please. Uh, a very good possibility will be also to use this uh, uh, hydrogen uh, turbine also uh, when we have a gas, uh, a hydrogen gas uh, pipeline, then we can use this uh, turbine also in the city or in the industrial area to support the grid, to support the, the train uh, grid, and so on. And so uh, we get a very uh, good possibility uh, without every uh, environmental problems. Yeah. Next picture, please. So uh, we have seen this uh, uh, problems by uh, uh, breakdowns uh, here. Uh, the uh, first picture with the synchronous generator on the uh, right side, the inverter system that we feed in uh, every time the reactive power in this time to support the grid. On the other side, uh, we have to control the frequency. On the left side, in the uh, 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 next uh, part, um, we seen that when we have to support uh, the grid, then we must, uh, that is, uh, it was a little bit too early. Uh, then we have uh, to reduce uh, the feed in power. And the last uh, picture was to show uh, the tolerance band where we not uh, can control. And uh, in the other way, we uh, can control on the one side uh, to more and the other side, more lesser uh, voltage and so on. Uh, the last point will be the future uh, prospects, and here we can use the benefits of uh, wind and PV systems. It means that we have the possibility to control uh, the active and reactive power very, very fast, uh, that we can uh, frequency uh, and voltage support by the grid code uh, fulfill. We can pre-arrange uh, energy input via wind and PV uh, systems uh, 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 via uh, the, uh, the power prognosis and uh, the spinning reserve to, to use uh, for the grid. It's also a possibility where we have not in the moment uh, in the action, then we have uh, the grid by the inverter systems decoupled from the rotating system. It means that we must develop new control systems so that we can use this spinning reserve, this very high spinning reserve of wind converter. Fast power control, fast control of voltage uh, dips and so on, and active uh, filters are also possible. What I have shown in some different uh, uh, projects in uh, European and the national projects. And uh, at last, we come to uh, the grid uh, again back. Uh, here you have the connection of the European. The... I cannot understand. Uh, the European, the North, uh, North African and uh, 
uh, Middle East road, uh, 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 grid, and though we can also expect by uh, uh, interconnected uh, system, um, uh, expect a better stability in all the grids, but there are some possibility, uh, possibilities fulfilled. Uh, next picture, please. Next picture, please, yeah. Uh, here, um, that we have the possibility to uh, connect different climate, uh, climate zones and so on, and uh, different renewables uh, that we get a very high capacity. This means high constant uh, of uh, uh, constants of uh, frequency and voltage. The uh, energy balance between temperature, climate, uh, tropical and uh, subtropical uh, and other uh, regions are possible and uh, the combining of wind, solar, hydro, and so balancing effects uh, and so on are possible using also the uh, inexpensive uh, wind and TV uh, energy on uh, different points and so on. Uh, next picture, please. But uh, in the technology, you get not every time uh, advantages. Uh, you have also disadvantages, and here it is so that we have long distance electricity uh, transmission with high costs and losses. Um, the grid stability uh, uh, problems can be uh, um, when we have uh, a utilization over high distances with this load uh, dependent and frequency uh, deviations uh, of the uh, regions can be used by, uh, caused by reactive power oscillation. So we have it in the European, European grid, uh, perhaps between uh, Romania uh, and Bulgaria and Portugal and Spain. Yeah. Next picture, please. Next picture, please. So <coughs> grid extension. Uh, means that uh, uh, the renewable systems have a full load hour time of about 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000. Uh, conventional systems have about 6,000. And so it means we need uh, a higher capacity of the grid when we extend uh, the renewables. Yeah? Uh, perhaps we must uh, 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 create uh, some zones in the different continents and so on. High voltage connection, a short uh, coupling uh, connection between the zones and high voltage AC uh, transmission lines between uh, our grids in European, Middle East and North Africa. And further aspects will be uh, that we can use uh, wind farms and uh, wind parks also as a part of virtual uh, power plants and smart grids, uh, direct supply of industry and consumers, direct mar marketing and blockchain in the, uh, this uh, sector. This was the last, uh, the last picture, please. Thank you for your attention. Here you see my uh, uh, books in German and uh, English, and you will have uh, a link for this uh, hydro uh, uh, a uh, hydrogen um, turbine. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Hayat. So we have covered a overall aspect of the grid aspect of it and also uh, pause to the present. Okay, in the interest of time, we'll, I think we can take questions at the last. So next up, we'll have the much. You must excuse that. I, <laughs> that's why we not need so much time. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Excuse. Can I have Majid, uh, please, from Jamia? Is he there? Uh, hello. Uh, good, 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 good evening, everyone. Uh, good morning, depending upon uh, wherever you are. Am I audible, sir? Yeah, you can audio, but uh, you have to bit cl come closer to the mic. I think uh, very stable voice. And please, a uh, time is to 10 minutes. 
Yeah, yeah. Hello. Is it is it is it audible now, sir? Yeah, it's audible. Please go ahead. <laughs> so you have to share the screen. Sharing it. Is my is my share uh, is my screen visible, sir? Yeah. Maja, you can skip the introduction and come to the, the work pro properly. Okay. Okay. So I'll be yeah. inter uh, I'll be uh, uh, speaking upon the challenges and issue, uh, issues that are associated with the grid integration of renewable energy sources. Basic challenges. Uh, so in the introduction. Uh, we know that uh, the modern power system is an amalgamation of con uh, conventional as well as renewable energy sources. And uh, with sustainable development in mind, almost every country has a target to achieve in terms of uh, its renewable energy production and consumption. And in such a scenario, India seems to have taken a strong leap in its solar power production and development. Uh, talking statistically, in uh, the solar power capacity has increased 11 times in the last in the five years from 2014 to July 2019, which clearly depicts uh, India's rapid rise in the solar power production. Uh, well, the rise in the production can bear fruit, uh, fruits only with uh, large-scale integration of renewable energy systems into the existing power system. Uh, in fact, there is already a significant, significant integration of renewable energy systems into existing grid infrastructure, uh, but this has given rise to a number of technical as well as infrastructural challenges. And uh, I'll be touching upon few of the prominent challenges, technical challenges that we face while we integrate uh, such renewable energy sources into the grid. As we know that the grids are no longer a unidirectional entity with the advent of distributed generation based upon renewable energy sources. So with the rising renewable energy sources penetration, there are rising challenges uh, associated with it. A uh, few of the prominent ones that I'll be discussing are the strength of point of common coupling, the voltage right through capability, uh, the stability, uh, then the rate power compensation capability, protection issues, and power quality issues. Coming to the first challenge, the strength of point of common coupling. We know that this is the most critical point in our network because this is uh, where the This is the most critical point in the network because this is the point in the network where renewable energy distribution generator systems are connected to a network. Uh, it is here uh, where most of the disturbances from the renewable energy sources uh, take place. So it is understandable that uh, this PCC or point of common coupling uh, should be uh, robust uh, in order to overcome all mechanical or electrical stresses. So how do we measure the strength of So how do we measure the strength of this uh, point of common coupling? It is uh, well known that the active power control and regulation in accordance with the grid frequency uh, requirements is, is done at uh, PCC. So the strength of PCC is identified by a uh, term called uh, short circuit ratio, which is uh, nothing but uh, voltage, uh, the grid voltage squared divided by the uh, grid impedance and the power rating of the uh, distributed generator. Uh, so what we, uh, what we, uh, how we identify the strength of the point of common coupling uh, using this SCR is if the SCR is greater than 10, then we say that uh, this particular network is uh, strong enough uh, for, uh, for the renewable energy integration. And if the SCR is less than uh, 10, then we say this particular network is uh, weak for the renewable energy integration. So it's understandable that uh, for grid integration of large amount of wind or PV systems, the PCC voltage level has to be high, as, uh, as high as possible to limit the voltage variations. The, another issue is of voltage ride through capability or VRT. Uh, to, we know that to integrate renewable energy sources, uh, the renewable energy sources system <coughs> needs to be, to be capable of withstanding all vulnerabilities and stresses. 
and one such vulnerability is coping, coping up with the fault and riding through the voltage dips and spikes, uh, which we call as voltage ride through capability. And as per IEEE standard 1547, uh, grid connected wind and PV plants are expected to remain online and ride through zero voltage faults uh, for, a for a time of 150 milliseconds. Similarly, uh, it also defines the high voltage ride through requirement as 150 milliseconds, that's the 140 percent of the voltage rating. It has to work if the, if the voltage goes to the 140 percent of the nominal voltage, it has to bear it for 150 milliseconds. That is the voltage ride through capability that a distributed generation system based upon renewable energy source, uh, renewable energy source should have. Uh, so the fault ride through capability enables the renewable energy source based DGs to sustain fault conditions for a short duration of time. Now what happens uh, if the uh, fault persists? There is, there is all possibility that the fault, per, fault may persist for a longer time. So what will happen if the fault persists for a longer time? So what happens is uh, that as the fault, if the, uh, if the fault persists and the frequency or the voltage goes beyond the allowable operating range, the conventional grid system requires that the DGs based upon renewable energy should be disconnected. So what happens is that when, the, when there is a significant amount of uh, uh, distributed generation systems already in place, uh, you'll have to simultaneously disconnect large number of distributed generations. And what happens due to that is that there is a significant uh, catastrophic threat of throwing the grid into instability. And uh, once uh, an event of instability has taken place, uh, owing to the less inertia involved with the renewable energy systems, uh, it does not have the capability to stop the aggravation of stability problem. Uh, then, uh, which further leads to instability again, and a chain reaction sort of starts uh, 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 from that. So further instability, further disconnection, so this chain reaction goes on. So the stability issue is there. Then the most important issue, another important issue with the grid connection uh, of the renewable energy systems is of protection issues. We know that modern power system uh, thrives upon a strong, robust protection and switch gear. Uh, and with the penetration of renewable energy sources into conventional power system, uh, it has a strong impact upon the protection system that is already in place there. And uh, the main challenges with regards to that are change in short circuit level, uh, lack of sustained fault current, and blinding of protection. If I talk about the change in short circuit level, uh, we see that when we rate the circuit breakers, uh, we rate it according to the short circuit current levels. Uh, and this short circuit level uh, current is characterized by the equivalent uh, system impedance at the fault point. So what happens with the renewable energy systems in the system uh, the equivalent network impedance can in, can decrease. Uh, as it decreases, it can uh, lead to the further rise in the fault level. So when the fault level increases, that means that uh, under this situation, uh, there, uh, it may it may be possible uh, that the fault current exceeds the breaking capacity of the existing circuit breakers. Another important protection issue is of lack of sustained fault current. We, we know that in order for the relays to operate properly, a sustained fault current should flow through it. Uh, the fault current contribution of a renewable uh, DG system owing to the use of induction generators is small for both three-phase faults and asymmetrical faults. Also, power electronic devices used in PV systems are designed to internally limit the output current since these cannot withstand significant overcurrent for a sustained period of time. So lack of sustained fault current means the mal, mal, mal operation of uh, the relay system, which in turn leads to uh, blinding of the protection, which means that in presence of renewable energy systems, uh, the grid contribution to the total fault current will reduce. And due to this, it is possible uh, that a short circuit stays undetected because the grid con contribution to the short circuit current never reaches the pickup current of the feeder relay. Hence, protections based on overcurrent relays and directional relays, which work on the detection of abnormal currents, 
can suffer malfunction because of the reduced grid contribution. And another important issue that uh, we face during the grid integration is of power quality. We know that compliance with the power quality is the most predominant issues among all while integrated renewable energy sources, uh, particularly wind and solar power systems. The reason uh, many studies believe is because these renewable energy sources based upon uh, solar PV systems or wind power systems are intermittent in nature what does, and, and are highly dependent upon the atmospheric conditions that they are in. Plus, uh, the uh, high, uh, high usage of nonlinear components at various power conversion stages also contribute to the fact, uh, also contribute uh, to the power quality deteriorations uh, that happen due to the integration of uh, renewable energy systems. So if, uh, if we talk about the power quality issues, the main, main power quality events associated with the integration of renewable energy could be uh, broadly three. These are voltage disturbances, total harmonic distortions, and frequency deviations. Although there can be other power quality issues also, but uh, these three are mainly found when we integrate renewable energy system into the existing power system. Talking about the voltage disturbance, there are two aspects with respect to voltage. Uh, these integrated renewable energy sources predominantly need to take care of. Uh, first, being fluctuations. Budget, in the voltage. Can I complete uh, in another one minute, please? Yes, yes. I'm just completing it. Uh, first one being the fluctuations in the voltage supplied by the renewable energy sources, and the second being to cope up with the fluctuations impressed upon by the grid side. Uh, also, the presence of uh, distribution generators such as uh, photovoltaic or wind generators is found to imbalance the system voltage in a distribution network. Uh, the voltage conventionally in a passive network may go above or below the specified limits, but with the DGs, the tendency of the voltage is to go beyond upper limit. Uh, another important power quality issue is of total harmonic distortion. We know that uh, various converters are used at various stages in uh, both uh, wind energy systems and photovoltaic systems, uh, which, res uh, which are working at high switching frequencies. Uh, so what happens is large amounts of harmonics are injected into the supply, and these harmonic currents are responsible uh, for vol voltage distortion in the grid supply, and uh, that leads to uh, greater power quality issues. The last power quality issue that is important is the frequency deviation. Uh, it is due to the absence of direct coupling between the rotating parts and the power system uh, that leads to no control or regulation of frequency with the integrated renewable energy sources. In fact, the reduced inertia increases the rate of change of frequency when a disturbance or power imbalance due to faults or sudden changes in loads takes place. So let me just conclude uh, my presentation here. Uh, by saying that although there are infrastructural challenges involved in the grid integration of renewable energy sources uh, for a feasible and widespread penetration of renewable energy sources, the technical challenges uh, like that of stability, frequency deviation, power quality enhancement, etc., are important challenges we need to address while integrating renewable energy sources. Also, with ever-increasing presence of alternative sources of energy, including uh, renew renewable energy sources, as the challenge uh, to integrate them with the existing power system, have also evolved. Hence, continuous efforts are needed for more comprehensive understanding of all such challenges and accordingly develop uh, improved mitigation techniques. Thank you. That will be all uh, from. Thank you, Majid. So you try to cover the important challenges of the source circuit and right to capabilities part of it. Yeah. So we'll reserve the questions at the uh, last, depending upon the time. We have a couple of more speakers are there. I invite uh, Sony sir for his uh, presentation, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Balraman. Thank you, WWAIA, the organizers, for giving me this opportunity. I'm very happy to be amongst the very exalted panel which we have. We have heard very extensive technical aspects, uh, both from the academia and the practitioners. So I would not make any presentation. Let me very quickly put up a, around a dozen points uh, as a bullets. So first thing first, so the target of RE are very ambitious, very loud and clear from the rooftop. Challenges are many. 
and it's basically an energy transition. It would take time and the road is going to be bumpy. There is no silver bullet and there is no magic wand. Besides technical, we need to work on many, many areas. Let me say a few from the grid integration point of view and the uh, large RE, how do we accommodate that? Forecasting. Forecasting has become a very serious business, be it load, be it wind, be it solar. And it's continuously improving. And forecasting has to be repeated. It's a repeated game. And um, uh, AI and uh, uh, so many other technologies are being applied on it. But we would see large scale improvement. But with solar, the resource adequacy is a very serious issue. The resource adequacy, the techniques which we adopted before the renewables came in are no longer valid. The capacity value of wind to be in, how do we include those things are serious as far as security of supply is concerned and the resource adequacy is concerned. Portfolio balancing. I have been a system operator for more than four decades. Portfolio balancing was rather simple because uh, the consumer pattern was known, but now the consumer has become prosumer and we really do not know how he would behave in future. All the experience of last hundred years would not come to our rescue. We need to unlearn and relearn as far as the load forecast is concerned. Dr. Kanan, I hope I am audible and uh, it's okay. You're audible, sir. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, portfolio balancing in all the time horizon is another very serious uh, subject which both academia and practitioners need to work. Flexibility is the mantra. If we need to pick up few things, I would pick up flexibility. And flexibility isn't very easy. We need to define flexibility. We should be able to measure flexibility. We must pay for flexibility and incentivize flexibility. And this flexibility has to be in the entire value chain, right from each kind of source to transmission, to consumer flexibility, the regulation flexibility, market flexibility, everywhere we would need flexibility. As I said, it, it requires a suit of mitigation measures. So if I was to pick up few of them, besides flexibility, I would pick up transmission. Larger the grid, better it is. Larger balancing area is certainly uh, you know, uh, averages out the variations and uh, is a sure shot way of accommodating intermittent and variable renewable generation. We need larger footprint. And that's exactly why uh, you know, the, there is a move for OSOWOG. We heard about NSOE uh, map from uh, Professor Hayer. Similarly, India also is expanding the grid. We have moved towards Bangladesh, Nepal, Bhutan, and um, soon Myanmar would also be connected. Sri Lanka is being talked about. So if you need to integrate uh, offshore wind of uh, Sri Lanka, then it must get connected through uh, to the larger grid of India. So expanding the grid is uh, certainly one of the solutions and technology is coming up, be it HVDCs, be it uh, statcoms, be it uh, uh, light HVDC and uh, so many other technologies. I will not uh, take time to, because there are experts who know about it. So transmission is the key. And uh, transmission, the way it has been looked and the way now it is to be looked post renewable era, will be completely different. Transmission 
besides transmitting power you would give access to the market it will bring in competition and connectivity we heard about connectivity a lot connectivity is a very serious business point of coupling what are the rules regulations standards which one has to follow let me gather courage and say very boldly that now renewable is no more you know child it has become adult we need to throw the kids glove out and groom renewables so that it can provide everything what a conventional generator provides plus something it is possible because conventionals were analog kind of a thing big systems but uh, wind and solar they are all uh, uh, inverter based can act much faster and uh, there is a lot of research going on in this so we need to rewrite our regulation and standards and only writing the regulation won't work compliance testing ensuring that everything what gets connected to the large grid follows the standard be it all right through reactive power uh, primary control there are uh, renewable uh, solar parks and wind farms which have uh, uh, which takes agc signal so uh, honoring all the limitations which we have we must be able to derive primary secondary and even synthetic energia from the renewable large plants and it and i'm sure the research is going on in this direction so besides this technical and the physical system we need institutional engineering the new set of institutions have to come up who would take care of this energy transition normally this institutional engineering is neglected and is building institutions takes time for example distribution distribution system operator or um, you know the even the regulatory system also these these institutions would take time so we must uh, work on that uh, very aggressively it will take decades to for systems to mature technically in our academia all these things have been taught for last uh, uh, few decades but uh, institutional engineering uh, as far as the governance is concerned is very important because as a system operator once upon a time i used to say that there cannot be a generator in the grid which i don't know i know every transmission every generator but today nobody can claim this there are thousands and hundreds of thousands of small generators scattered everywhere it's a different ball game altogether so um, the old operators like me have to unlearn and relearn the renewable business that is why we have renewable energy management center the forecasting with limited information with lot of uncertainty is again a different uh, and a, a new subject yeah now let me switch over to the market market is also a very powerful uh, tool um you know market uh, would bring uh, the uh, competition reduce the cost <clears throat> make people flexible reward the uh, you know flexibility so market and its various products be they had real time and actually market reserves so many things are there so designing markets with renewable is a real challenge having said this i would say market is not panacea unless the technical aspects are put in place market would also not work there is a hidden hand of market but there has to be also explicit hand of uh, system operator planners and designers to make a physical robust system looking at the paucity of time i would conclude saying that it all requires consistency what can be achieved in short term is overestimated and what can be achieved in long term is underestimated we need consistency we need long term commitment 
and uh, need to address the entire continuum and entire all the areas besides technical institutional governance aspects economics market and institutional arrangements with this i am absolutely sure that the next generation would like 100% re and that should be possible thank you very much for this opportunity so thank you sir so as you just say you put uh, eloquently all the points what is required and main important is what you are trying to talk about right trying to coupling between technical economical institutional mechanisms the governance and everything is going to be decoupled there's going to be a critical challenge as we move forward part of, part, part of it and of course we are not trying to talk about it's going to be insurmountable but it's achievable and definitely the research need to come in this particular shape so we'll reserve a question sir to the last and i'll now request ms colleague uh, professor colleague to come on line please professor colleague yes sorry i was uh, because you referred to my first name i thought somebody we had some other colleagues okay in there. okay sorry <laughs> sorry about that uh yes i am uh now Can I at least do ten minutes because time is a bit of a we are running short of time. Yep. Can you see my presentation? No, not yet. You have to you have to share your presentation. Okay. Is it uploading or not? I'm not sure. No. No. Okay. Then let me go back here and share content. Yeah, of course. Sorry, I forgot to confirm that. We really apologize for the delay. I'll try to be as concise as possible. Can you see my slide now? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Please. So basically, I'm going to talk about the grid aspects uh, through uh, the combination of uh, uh, large scale upscaling, HVDC, and the hydrogen. And so it's basically linked to the challenge we have. Uh, basically, uh, because of the trade winds, we have a fossil footprint of 72% of the world phosphate reserves, and as you know, 90% of them are used uh, for fertilizers. And uh, that's why you need uh, the ammonia, which is the main uh, market for uh, green hydrogen currently. And so we have an opportunity to then uh, deploy uh, green ammonia uh, for uh, the serving international fertilizer markets, in which the Mor Morocco is very big. Uh, and Mauritania has iron ore, and so that has also uh, possibilities. There are possibilities to produce green steel using green hydrogen. And of course, uh, as we're talking about the Sahara coastline, uh, there are desalination loads all along the coastline, but are spreading further north. So all these are a mix between loads and the challenge between uh, remote uh, wind generation from load centers. And so it, it will require a combination and uh, to be able to deploy a high voltage direct current line. And as you will see, uh, the issue of the high voltage direct current line is an issue of uh, operational balancing at the feed end as well as at the end of use. And so I'm just gonna refer you to the three yellow triangles, which is Jorflasfar. And this is where the main processing, the largest phosphate hubs of the world is located. And, and uh, that's where we need to provide either power or green ammonia. And so uh, one of the options is to look at the operational balancing of the system where North Africa and uh, Europe can be deserved by a uh, uh, large scale high voltage direct current infrastructure using the phosphate fertilizer processing, because I'm going to show you the scale of that processing needed, and uh, equally using the iron ore transformation into green uh, steel, you will also be able to deploy a very large uh, power uh, transmission infrastructure. So, uh, there are two types of architecture possible the line to line HVDC and uh, the distributed uh, system. And uh, the main advantage of the point to point is the low losses over long distances. Main advantage of the evolutive uh, voltage source converter is, of course, the flexibility of the grid, which then enables you to save on transmission losses and have uh, uh, advantages of deserving different points, among others, uh, the Jorflasfar phosphate hubs and the other 
uh, load centers in order to connect uh, Morocco, which is already connected, but uh, effectively transfer power to the European uh, power networks and also enable imports from the European power network. So this is uh, the largest fertilizer production hub uh, located about 1,000 kilometers away from uh, the Sahara trade wind blown coastline. And so you have all the ingredients of uh, green hydrogen usage. You have ammonia uh, storage. You have the steel plant, uh, fertilizer plants, where then you need green uh, ammonia. And you also have a large coal fire power plant, which is the base, base load for Morocco's power, where you can also recycle the CO2 and provide uh, uh, methanol. It will be uh, uh, blue methanol, I suppose, because you already have a source of uh, coal, uh, a source of uh, carbon, which comes from a coal fire power plant. And so we are involved in uh, looking at the, with the government and government institution, looking at the short, mid and long term uh, prospects of the hydrogen costs for this industry. And so there are two options. Either you provide, uh, either you generate the electrolysis locally on the Atlantic coastline and then transfer it through ammonia or ultimately by pipeline to the end of use, to the uh, phosphate fertilizer uh, processing plants or you transfer the electricity uh, to that phosphate fertilizer plant, processing plant. And then if you do that, then you have to, you can scale up the transmission infrastructure and then distribute green power to the entire Moroccan uh, load uh, centers, which are located uh, further to the north. So the advantage is not only will you be able to uh, provide green hydrogen for this industry, just to remind you, uh, Morocco imports about 2 million tons of ammonia per year. To produce this ammonia using uh, renewables, you need about 8 gigawatt of renewables. So that's the size of the entire uh, uh, capacity of the Moroccan grid. Or uh, It's a little bit higher, but it is close to, uh, it is way above the peak load, at least, to, to say the least. So it's just to show you that the hydrogen dimension of this industry, greening the fertilizer industry using uh, hydrogen, will enable massive rollout of renewables and then you will also look at ancillary services of electrolyzers with the grid and uh, you have to make sure that you can uh, store uh, hydrogen on a seasonal base and then you can also provide backup to the grid and use uh, electricity generated from the stored hydrogen uh, on the seasonal basis. So all these require a mapping out and the capacities looking at uh, various aspects of the uh, managing salt caverns, which Morocco has for butane gas, but not yet for hydrogen. And uh, the case studies are multiple because also in the process of producing hydrogen and ammonia and various uh, green fuels, you have to make sure you have a continuous uh, generation and uh, supply of hydrogen. So there are lots of, uh, 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 it's essential to have a steady stream of hydrogen, hence the storage. Uh, if you look at uh, Mauritania's iron ore industry, you, also, you already have all the components of that industry. Uh, you have the foundry, you have the main export of that country is iron ore. So the foundry has already wind turbines, has arc ovens. The only missing part is the electrolyzers. There are uh, wind farms coming online nearby. But what is most interesting in the region is to note uh, the big uh, part to x application that have been announced. 30 gigawatt for uh, one project and 10 gigawatt for another. And this will ultimately, uh, because of the scale of the project, will have some impact on the grids and the operational balancing of the uh, HVDC infrastructure for which we have done uh, capacity building, at least in the green hydrogen sector in both countries, Morocco and Mauritania. I also want to mention there is a project connecting Morocco, the south of Morocco with the UK to a 1,600 kilometer underwater line. A 10 gigawatt project for providing 3.5 gigawatt of continuous green power, so uh, more competitive than the Hinkley Point power, uh, power plant, and it's led by uh, the Saudi Aqua Power Company. So uh, it's about to come online on between 2025 and 2030. So there are lots of different projects now, mega projects that look either to supply global markets of ammonia or even to connect large uh, uh, renewable capacities through uh, under sea cables to different uh, markets. What is interesting here in terms of high voltage direct current projects in the world, there are over 300 gigawatts operational, is to see, uh, first of all, the scale, the largest ones are 12 gigawatt big over 3,400 kilometer distance. 
And uh, there is also an interesting trend, which is the hybridization between uh, point-to-point -point configurations put together with uh, voltage source converters. So the idea is the long distance connection and to take advantage of the distribution of the voltage source converter uh, projects. This is what is happening in China, amongst others. I described you the Morocco X-Links project, Morocco UK interconnection project, and the many different projects that you have in uh, providing uh, green hydrogen. The most advanced one is, of course, the Saudi uh, 5 gigawatt neon project, which is being built uh, and is the first one that is going to come online at this scale. I want to mention also the issue of desalination and access to water. So, uh, interestingly enough, for the hydrogen, the amount of electricity you need to provide the water for the electrolysis is about one thousandth of the amount you need to uh, produce the hydrogen. So, essentially, the load for electrolysis is very minimal for in the green hydrogen uh, dimension, at least. But that will enable, because of the scale of the operation, it will enable to massively roll out desalination plants. And this is important for the supply of uh, the region, uh, which is essentially uh, fed the desalination plant. There is 755 megawatt operational that are feeding the region's uh, desalination plants and the cities. And uh, further are in construction that already look at sustainable agriculture, uh, feeding directly electrolyzer, uh, sorry, desalinated water for agricultural production and making sure that sustained agriculture is economically competitive, it is happening. And of course, the desalination plants, larger ones, are moving further north where you will need ultimately a uh, high voltage direct current transmission line to make sure that uh, you're engaging into green uh, processes. Last, last but not least, I want to show those mega projects. They also have a climate. I mean, we're just coming out of the uh, COP26 in Glasgow. There are climate models that show that if you deploy massive amounts of uh, wind and solar energy on the Sahara, and in that case, it will be on the Sahara coastline using the trade winds, you will have a drag effect and reduced albedo, which can have also climatic impact, positive climatic impact, resulting in increased precipitations. And this is just uh, to conclude, this was the first wind diesel uh, test site that I installed in 1994 on the Sahara coastline back then, the main challenge was precisely to uh, manage the loads uh, because the wind generated the power was so high. And then the idea was to make sure we could desalinate and engage in sustainable agriculture. And so with that, I think I conclude. I have the last slide is the banknote of Morocco showing the hydro projects of the 60s. And now the last ones is the wind turbines in the desert. And you can see that the water and access to water is always central in this region. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, colleague. I think you nicely covered the future prospects for the integration and also creating the flexibility in the grid with the kind of a loads what you're going to have. So these systems is going to have had more flexibility so that we can manage the intermittency or the variability of the renewables. Thank you, colleague. And Sishir, you want to have a small intervention? Yes. Uh, uh, thanks, uh, Balramji, for giving me this opportunity. Of course, I am not a grid expert, so I will not talk about grid, but uh, I'll just explain a little bit about a new uh, uh, project which we are doing with uh, uh, Futures uh, uh, Forum for Future Energy, uh, Terry, and uh, WWF World Wildlife Foundation and uh, uh, Landesa. Uh, so we are working on making renewable energy responsible. The whole concept is that now that renewable energy is going to get uh, large, uh, you know, large scale installations. Uh, so far, uh, the presumption is that renewable energy projects are environmentally benign and there is no environment uh, impact assessment is required. Uh, but the uh, recent uh, studies which we have done under the project uh, of renewables to responsible energy, we have noticed that there are, uh, you know, the impacts uh, which are not uh, positive impacts, but uh, impacts on environment, on uh, ecology, and also uh, sometimes on the uh, social aspects uh, where uh, land uh, land rights uh, uh, community rights uh, are violated 
and, uh, and so and and so forth. So the whole idea is now to look at the renewable energy implementation framework uh, from the perspective of uh, uh, you know re regenerative and just the uh, future where one is looking at uh, are we putting back to natural and social systems then we take out you know, when we put a, a system we do some development project in the particular geography or in the particular community the second aspect is recognizing the interconnectedness of all the natural systems as we uh, as well as the independent interdependence of planetary health with human health and well-being so uh, uh, every aspect of interconnectedness of natural systems is to be looked into uh, the third aspect of uh, the regenerative and just future is shifting how value is created as well as what is valued so that equity is built into the system with ensuring the dignity and well-being of all as a whole so uh, that is the uh, just a uh, part of it so that every every uh, community member is um, uh, is ensuring uh, you know his or her dignity and also the uh, value is built across the system in an equitable manner and the last aspect of this is actively built capacity to ensure that ecological and human systems have capacity to adapt, evolve, and thrive in the context of the change. So the change is coming in, in terms of uh, renewables, and uh, uh, we are then uh, we have done some deep evaluation of the uh, you know ground realities of the of the renewable energy projects in the context uh, we have developed the uh, 3f framework uh, which is basically uh, finitude that is uh, based on physical and biological resources which are uh, finite and there are limits to how much we can use now this is also true for some of the renewable resources such as uh, you know water or uh, biomass for example uh, if the rate of extraction is greater than the rate of recharge, then you may have a negative biomass uh, uh, situation. Or uh, so, so that is the finitude aspect of uh, the framework so fragility. That is vulnerability of an ecosystem to different kinds and scales of shocks at a given point of time. For example, uh, you know, uh, system when system breaks down. Uh, causing the environmental and social damage or often environmental and social shocks can compound or feed off each other uh, to create unexpected or disproportionate impact. Uh, the third, uh, third aspect of the framework is fairness. So recognition and protection of human rights as well as the concept of social and ecological justice uh, uh, is being uh, studied. Uh, so both intra-generational uh, fairness, that is the uh, different uh, fairness between different people and species within the same generation, and intergenerational fairness, ensuring our actions are fair to future generations while attempting our own uh, well-being. So uh, that is the framework under which we are evaluating the uh, projects. And now in this second phase, uh, we are uh, uh, interacting with the industries. Uh, with the uh, all the stakeholders, whether it is industry, whether it is government or policy makers or or the financial institutions uh, and project implementers, and uh, we are trying to uh, work out uh, some uh, uh, you know uh, code of conduct or a framework for uh, responsible renewable energy generation and uh, so that the future projects where the scales will be very high uh, we are just uh, we are right now around 100 gigawatt and we are looking at more than 500 gigawatt by 2030 in another 10 years so we are be adding uh, what we have added so far uh, in next uh, you know five or four times or five times of that so that is going to be a challenge uh, in terms of the resources and we are also looking at uh, the, uh, the uh, you know mining activity for the, the resources to end of the product after the life cycle 
what uh, you know how the product is this uh, you know dismantle the projects and the uh, the recycling of the uh, uh, the equipment uh, which are old and which have lived their life uh, so so that this study uh, uh, which is which will uh, complete in march but uh, we will uh, we are having a, a very uh, you know deep interaction with the all the stakeholders on a regular basis and we we'll, uh, we also look forward to uh, inputs uh, from the other stakeholders uh, who can be interested in this uh, with this i will stop here and uh, i uh, thank uh, again the uh, uh, you know uh, session chair and co chair for giving me this opportunity thank you uh, thank you sashi ji and uh, we had a very interesting discussions from all the aspect of it and particularly we are trying to talk about because the subject is on the hardy part of it and moving forward how we are going to look at the grid part of it and of course all the panelists have given a clear dimensions right from the academic part of it to the the practical aspect of it and moving forward definitely is going to be a challenge it's not going to be like what you have learned in the last 100 years we are going to be repeating the same rather we are going to we we need to hand learn and we need to learn and relearn this is a kind of a concept to move forward and as we rightly put by sony sir the flexibility in every aspect of it so now we need to create a flexibility so called the load we don't have the flexibility part of it but we are trying to create a flexibility not just in the small scale but we are trying to talk about in the additive production part of it desalination these are going to be a bigger energy consumers moving forward so we are going to see this is a kind of a gumbels where they are going to talk about where the energy is going to be regulated to the variations what you are going to see in the renewable energy and coming to the challenges definitely there are a lot of challenges are there one is on the forecasting and definitely i can say forecasting the way we are doing it and we are trying to see a confidence level of going up to 90 to 92% to 90% a day ahead and going up to 95% on intra day to get a forecasting accuracy at the state level and of course there are a lot of challenges are there and we are talking about when it is say the forecasting we are trying to talk about on a day ahead or maximum seven, seven days ahead but moving forward if you are talking about portfolio of a year ahead or a two years ahead this is where the challenge is going to be on the re so the forecasting for the year ahead is a big challenge what you are trying to talk about today because why we talk about year ahead is the resource what you are trying to talk about it depends on the weather the weather modeling for forecasting for the future is a very critical task because we already seen in the last year the wind in india has come down by 20% whereas this year compared to 2019 itself we have seen almost like 2 to 3% more compared to 2020 the wind generation roughly around 25% to 28% is higher so these kind of variations going to be there the same is getting repeated for the solar also so because the kind of a fog environment smog environment definitely solar variations also there so we need to take this as a challenge so we have to talk about what we are trying to say on the forecasting no not just limiting to the day ahead but we have to move forward at this medium term ranging from 6 months to at least a couple of years this is a one challenge definitely is going to be a big data analytics team what we need to have it the big weather modeling coupling weather modeling with the resource data modeling part of it and translating that into the grid modeling yes this is a challenge we need to overcome and need to move forward okay and as i rightly put it the renewable energy is no longer a side player now the renewable energy become a main actor and if you're talking about moving forward he is going to be the probably maybe the only actor we are going to have maybe along with the hydro and the nuclear as a green energy and with this scenario definitely we are going to see a lot and lot of the analytics is going to come in the portfolio what you are trying to talk about and if you try to see today what you are trying to see we are coming to a full circle now where we started the lcd grid as a very small grid maybe a street as a one grid we used to have in the 1890s and it a multiple grid or multiple frequency maybe we are going to reinvent the same now we are trying to talk about the nano grids the micro grids and now every residence can be a micro grid with the kind of a storage cost coming down with the hydrogen and the other things the economy is going to be there possibly the consumer himself as a prosumer today is trying to connect to the grid 
But if the ability is not going to be reliable or anything, if you want to 99.99 or 49 reliability, then you may have a choice for having all this kind of storage and setting which own grid to create almost close to 100% reliability because that's a, one of the requirement of the most of the consumers. So on the days of not far off, we can have the micro grid, nano, uh, nano grid on one hand. At the same time, we are going to have a larger grid with our prime ministers talking about one sun, one world, and one grid. So we are trying to talk about the super grids being evolved. The super grid of the European Union is already there. And we are trying to talk about the South Asian super grid now with the interconnection with the Bangladesh, Nepal, Bhutan, and Myanmar going forward with the Sri Lanka. And also we are talking about the East Asian network with the connection of Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, they got interconnected. And possibly we're trying to talk about, see, these are the kind of a link we're trying to talk about how we are going to create a super grid. So we are going to have not just the grid, we are talking super grid on one hand, at the same time, we are also seeing the kind of a control you need for the nano grid. So you need to see a wide spectrum of the controllability, the wide spectrum of operation part of it. Yes, very, very small system of the couple of kilowatts as a one grid, and to go for the thousands of gigawatt of another grid. So you are going to see that both extremes, but these are going to be existing. We need to design the controls. We need to do the, the operation part of it, and we need to design a lot of analysis, how we are going to talk about that. This is what we are trying to talk about as a problem proposition for my researchers so that they can start working on this particular domain. And you can see a lot of challenges. I say, always say, only when there's challenges are there, engineers are remembered. If there's no challenges, the engineers will not be remembered at all. So definitely we'll be remembered and you are going to be in the prime light with a lot of challenges are there. And as engineers, no, we are no, no longer domain with the only technical aspect of it. We need to be the multidisciplinary. This is a clear, clear approach. So we need to have a coupling of the market. The market is going to give a clear signal. So as you rightly point out by Sony that renewable energy being a main actor, it has to play a critical role what a conventional power plant has to play. Yes, today, if you try to talk about compared to the conventional power plant, it's going to be like an analog signal spot of it. The, this, the, the new renewable energy source of both wind and solar is going to be digital. You can have a lot many controls can be possible, but if that has to be taken up, definitely we need to have the market. The market signal has to give it. If you can give enough compensation for the wind and solar IPPs, the investors, definitely they can participate in all the aspects of the grid, including the primary control, the secondary and tertiary control part of it, and also the, the challenges what you're trying to talk about the grid integration. So I think I'll seek uh, Professor uh, Marco for your uh, final comments, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so many wonderful speech, wonderful presentations in this session. Uh, we are sure we are now going to the new world of the carbon neutral uh, and the RE 100% in near future. We would like to gather our uh, power to the uh, same directions. And yes, thank you very much uh, to at attending this session. Okay, but uh, before going to go, uh, concluding the session, where is the final ceremony in this uh, session? Jeremy, are you here? Where is the... Uh, yeah, 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 I'm here. So uh, that is in Mahogany, the closing Mahogany. ceremony. Mahogany. 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 Okay. Now uh, we would like to conclude this session now. It's okay. Thank okay, you. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, wonderful session. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.